Ron Arnold is a free enterprise activist, an author, and a newspaper columnist. He is the executive vice president of the Center for the Defense of Free Enterprise. He writes for the Washington Examiner. He has written a series of books and was one of the very first in the nation to expose the radical environmental movement. His books include Trashing the Economy, Freezing in the Dark, and Undue Influence. Most importantly, Ron has pioneered methods to expose the money and the power of Big Green, and in his books and in his hundreds of magazine and newspaper articles. Ron is fierce. He demands the truth. He's detailed, and he never lets rumor guide him. He goes straight to the source and gets the facts. He has talked to people that you and I would never be able to get to, and he's asked them for the details, and they told him. And I'm proud to have Ron Arnold helping my efforts to educate you to all, so that we all understand the massive money web that is funding every level of the movement to transform America into what Ron calls an oligarchy to assure that you and I toe the proper environmental line. When Ron is finished today, you will not only know who funds them and how, but I believe you will have a much better knowledge or on how you can research these NGOs right there in your own community so that we can all achieve them. As you can see, if you've got it on the screen, it says environmental movement power, and the power is in big red letters. Uh, CJ, you want to go to the next slide now? Please. Okay. Uh, the main point of this whole thing is the environmental movement has many parts. I can't emphasize that enough, and as a matter of fact, by the time I'm finished with this, uh, probably 20, 30 minutes, you'll think uh, I, I did it a little bit, maybe too much. Uh, let's go to the next slide now. All right, a lot of parts of Big Green. And maybe you didn't know about all of these, but let's just go through the top of them. Everybody's heard of the environmental groups. We're talking Natural Resources, Defense Council, Sierra Club, people like that. Everybody's heard of them. It also includes Joe Blow's little two-bit outfit in Beaver Belch, Montana. And if anybody's in Beaver Belch right now, uh, that's not an insult. I'm, I'm just telling you. There's a lot of them. Uh, the second is foundation donors. A lot of people do not understand that foundations are the primary goal makers of the environmental movement. Uh, then under that is corporate donors. There are not a lot of them, and they're minimally important. We'll go into them in detail. All of these items on the screen, we'll go into detail a little bit. Then there are federal agency grants. Now, they don't make so much as the agenda as they do put unbelievable amounts of money into Big Green. And we will show some of that and how you can find it yourself. The next one is academia. We're talking about scientists, scientific uh, organizations, universities, institutions, um, teaching hospitals even. That's a surprise to some people. The last three all have to do with inter something or national something. Uh, I'm going to wait until we get there, but there are very special kinds of things that are very, very important on a global level that are very rarely talked about because most people have no idea what they are. And we're ready for the next slide, CJ, please. All right, I don't know if you can read all of this little stuff, but this is trying to tell you a little bit about where they were just a few years ago. There were about 16,000 green groups in 2000. That year, they had a total revenue of about $13.4 billion for all those 16,000 groups. Uh, that's a lot of groups. Now, to give you an idea that there's even some variety in environmental groups, and there's a lot, but the main ones you're going to run into are the educational kinds with limited lobbying power, the 501c3s, they call them. That's named after the section of the tax code where the rules are for what they can do. Some are civic groups, and uh, they're, they have unlimited lobbying powers, and they are called the 501c4s for the same reason in the tax code. Now, this is an important point to realize. Most enviro groups never heard of Agenda 21, and they have their own agendas for social control. Now, remember, social control is the name of the game of all of this. These guys are singing the same song, just from different uh, scripts. Uh, these people are coming at it mostly on the issues of climate change, pollution control, 
anti-corporate and anti-capitalist ideology. There's just scads of those. And anti-globalization. We'll talk about that a little later. We're ready for the next slide now, CJ. All right, just give you an idea of what these guys are like. Uh, the 10, or rather the 15 top green groups for 2012 had an aggregate income of $2.5 billion, and that's more than I've got. Uh, all of the ones in black really don't have a whole lot to do with Agenda 21. The ones in red, Sierra Club and Greenpeace International, have the most to do. There is one uh, second to the bottom in the left-hand column called Conservation International Foundation. It's a so-so, a, a little bit involved. Most of the rest of them have totally different um, agendas that go in different directions, but they're all allies under the skin, so just because they aren't, that they've never even heard of Agenda 21 for the most part, don't count them out because they're very important in the overall picture. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Thanks, Pete. About sustainable development, which is really the, that's probably the basic fundamental stable datum under uh, all of Agenda 21. It's about sustainable development. Now, tracking sustainable development groups is really tough for this reason. Sustainable development is a diffuse idea with no single definition it has no control center, and that makes it very tough to figure out is the I have a very sweet name environmental group, uh, is, is that a sustainable development outfit or not? You really have to do a lot of research to make sure. But what has happened is the idea has become a movement. Now, finding out what a movement is is very difficult and very important to understand what you're looking at and how to research it. Very important for me over the past 30 years. Movements have exact structures. I must have talked to about 20 people before I found people, somebody in the, uh, at the uh, academia that actually had been studying movements as movements all over the world. And here's what all movements have in common. There's just four points, so it's not that hard. They have separate groups. If it's one great big group, it is not a movement. They have many separate leaders. If there's just one leader, it is not a movement. They share an ideology. If they don't all have some core belief that they all sort of alike, it doesn't have to be exact, it's not a movement. They are networks. They're not organizations. They're not hierarchies. They are networks. Think of network like a, a fishnet. Uh, it strings, it holds held together with strings, as the old joke goes. But every place there's a knot in the net, that consider that's an individual, an organization, or something like that. And the lines that go to make up the network only have communication in a network of this kind we're talking about. A social change network only has communication lines. It does not have command lines. That's very important, very unlike everything we're used to, like in the military. Without command lines, it wouldn't work. With command lines, a movement would not work. There is no central control point. That complicates the problem a great deal. We've talked a lot on this slide, so we're going to go to the next one. CJ, please. Agenda 21 groups are primarily land use groups. Most, but not all, are small and local. And I think a lot of you have probably found that out to your grief. Um, they usually have rabid activists. And does that ring any bells with anybody? I'm sure it does. They usually attack property rights. Might be something else, uh, but when you talk about, about uh, urban planning and so on, that's exactly what you're dealing with. Uh, here are a couple of examples. I just listed some down here. Piedmont Environmental Council. Uh, anybody who lives in Virginia has undoubtedly heard about them. There's a nasty bunch of people. Land Trust Alliance. Don't know if you ever heard of them, but they're kind of a giant national version of Piedmont Environmental Council. Smart Growth America. Now, that's the urban planning bunch, and uh, we will have a surprise about money that they get a little later. Then there's the Rails to Trails Conservancy. This is an outfit that goes and finds abandoned railroad tracks, mostly near towns or big cities, and tries to get the government to buy them up and turn them into bicycle trails, hiking trails, or something like that for recreation. Uh, <clears throat> the problem is, is that somebody else owns the land uh, that was under those, because... 
when the railroad came by, they just bought an easement over the land, and at reversionary rights takes it back to the owner. So the owners have been losing their front yard, their backyard, sometimes their entire property. Uh, that's the problem with those guys, and uh, that puts them in square in Agenda 21. Uh, San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. Now, that's an unlikely Agenda 21 group, but believe me, it is, because they're looking particularly for the right to bicycle anywhere they want. You think about them on uh, roads, but that Rails to Trails Conservancy gives them a huge private property impact, and it's uh, it, it's something to consider. You, like I said, you can't really tell who's who, who is your enemy and who's your friend just by the name of it. Uh, Amnesty International, well, who defunct that? That's one of those... Wow, how did that get there? Well, let me tell you how it got there. They go. They are a part of what's called major groups in one of the United Nations propaganda outfits. The United Nations probably has uh, oh, two dozen or so very important uh, propaganda outfits. They don't really have a lot of power. They do have a lot of money. Uh, they don't. They have action programs that nobody does anything with. They just have a whole bunch of conferences and talk to each other like. Maybe some of us do that, too. But <clears throat> just to let you know that they're in there uh, big time, but in ways that you'd have to really study them to understand how. Uh, CJ, how about the next slide, please? There you go. Uh, this is Environmental Movement Power Foundations. So let's go to the next slide real quick, CJ. A foundation, what is that? It's a nonprofit trust. It's created by a wealthy individual, usually with a gift of stock, like if it's Joe Blow's uh, oil company. Well, okay, you give a bunch of stock in the company. It's converted by law to a diversified portfolio. Usually the law says you can only have 10 to 15% left over when it's diversified of your original kind of stock, like the Rockefeller Standard Oil stock. Well, they don't even have any more of that in any of the dozen or so uh, very important Rockefeller outfits. They've all got a diversified portfolio that they buy other guys. Now, grants that foundations give, and they're very, very, very important, are paid from dividends and capital gains from that stock portfolio, that diversified portfolio is where the grant money comes from. Now, nobody seems to understand this, but this is very important also. The public cannot donate to a private foundation. A private foundation is a closed uh, system, and that's very important. Uh, CJ, why don't we go to the next slide? We've just talked about foundations. Let's see if we can go from there. Now, this is the primary fact about foundations. Foundations set the environmental agenda by selecting who gets the money. That has been true pretty much from the beginning in 1970 when the Ford Foundation created uh, the environment are the Natural Resources Defense Council, but it became very important because about in the 1980s and 90s, there was something that changed, and that is on the next slide. CJ, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this was the era of invitation only prescriptive grants. Now, that's like a medical prescription you got to do this, take one, and call me in the morning. Well, this is a uh, much tougher. Programs are designed by the foundation managers. The Sierra Club, who takes foundation money, they take less than others, but Environmental Defense Fund, uh, all of the big ones that you think about, uh, Natural Resource Defense Council, as we mentioned before, their programs are designed not by people themselves in that group. They're, they are designed by foundation managers who decide what's, who's going to get the money and what it's going to uh, do. The grants come with instructions. Deliverables are required. What's a deliverable? A deliverable is your promise of, here's a description of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. It's an action plan. It's a management plan. And uh, performance is mandatory. You had better do what you want or you'll never see another dime uh, foundation money, and that will be the end of you if you're uh, a nonprofit organization. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's take a look at the, the influence in within uh, from 2000 to 2012. That's a little over a decade. Eighty-one billion dollars worth of foundation green grants uh, went from foundations over to 
uh, the Green Movement. You wonder why they have such ability and such uh, breadth. That's why. $81 billion will buy you a lot of propaganda. All right, if you take a look, uh, in 2012, there were 26,500, give or take. These are all estimates. Uh, about 10,000 more than there were in 2009. Uh, that's a big growth. Uh, but here's, here's the catch. Under 100 of those groups get over 90% of the foundation money. Okay. Now, uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, network power. This is how foundations work. When they have one of these uh, management-made projects, when they have a program of some sort, they will fund a whole network of different specialists. They will hire, essentially, they'll give grants to a lobbying group, to a media nonprofit, and there are about half a dozen really good ones of those. Uh, much to our chagrin. Uh, they will hire technical ones. They will hire uh, academic ones, scientists if they need them. Anything they need, they will hire, including that rent a riot kind of people to go out and, and give people trouble. All right, now, <clears throat> and this is part of the secret. Networks are the secret of power. They are nimble, they are fast, and they're hard to beat. When they're up against, when you're, let's say, a, a coal company and somebody's trying to put you out of business, they've got eight or ten programs that have beaten you. They've hit you from eight or ten different sides before you even know you've been hit. And that's why networks and the power of foundations is so great. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, just to get an idea, now this happens to be the network diagram and it took about a year and many thousands of dollars to get the software to put this together. Uh, of one land use campaign, happens to be in New Mexico, but it took us, every one of those lines you see is money. And every little box that you go to is an organization or a money source, a foundation. And uh, a, a more technical one, this one is, uh, condensed considerably because it was in two pages of a book, six by nine trim size book. And you can't really tell much detail, but uh, a real one, the big wall charts, you'd see the amount of money in the lines and you would see all of the people, particularly individuals that were troublesome and such in all the little boxes. But that gives you an idea what just one program has in it. It's got all of those different kinds of things from foundations to different kind of activity groups, umbrella group, people you don't even think of, uh, sportsmen's groups, uh, so on. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. I think I made that point. Okay. The largest networking center in the United States now is a group that's been around since the 19, early 90s, uh, the Environmental Grant Makers Association, just go by EDA. There's about 200, uh, probably about 250 now, foundations that uh, make strategy to direct about $6 billion a year between them, between those 200 or so. They have about that much. For the last couple of years, they've been spending about that much on different um, green groups. So that's a lot of money every year. Think about that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, operations. Yeah, we don't need to dwell on that. Let's go take a look and see what we're talking about here. Next slide, please. Okay, the minor donors to be green. Now, most corporate donations are given as a result of this blackmail, protests, or disruptions of business. Probably one of the biggest and perhaps the best known, but not many of these are known, it's Home Depot started spending money and doing all kinds of things because the Rainforest Action Network ran through their stores in about a dozen cities, threw all of the products on the floor, scared the living heck out of people, had people in the driveways that would not let people in, they would harass people from going into the store, call them names, it just absolutely gave them months of real agony, and there was nothing anybody could do about it. Uh, so they just gave in. Now, most such donations usually go only to the offending activist group. That was the case of uh, the uh, Rainforest Action Network, but uh, all the money from that particular thing. Some of them, however, are smart and they, you're uh, going to 
I have to spread this money around to our friends. Yeah, what do you need, Tom? All right, there are a few big corporations that uh, people have heard of that are part of Big Green, like Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. They make a lot of money, they make a lot of ice cream, and they give a lot of that money to green groups. Patagonia is the name of an outdoor gear outfit. Uh, they sell a lot, and they give a lot to green groups. Recreational equipment happens to be the former home of our interior secretary, uh, Secretary Jewell, came from the CEO position of recreational equipment. The Esprit clothing line um, was a husband wife outfit to begin with. There was a nasty divorce. Uh, the uh, husband got cash, and with that cash, he created the foundation for deep ecology, which has been very influential in spreading ideas that are about ecology, but they help the Agenda 21 crowd a great deal. Okay, let's go to the next slide, CJ, thanks. All right, federal grants. Now, this is gonna, you're gonna, gonna kick when you see the, let's go to the next slide right away, CJ. This is, uh, most federal grants and contracts are posted online. You can go and look at them yourself. That's one of the few. Most of the things that we've been talking about require enormously expensive pay databases to find that stuff out. This one, anybody can do for free. USAspending.gov will get you a lot. And uh, every agency has, like, the EPA's grant awards database down at the bottom. You can go on the web and find this yourself. Okay, next slide. This is going to knock your socks off. Sustainable development grants. Just go into Spending USA, USA Spending, and you're going to find a whole bunch like these groups here. Smart Growth America got $4.1 million, give or take, from the Environmental Protection Agency and the National Endowment for the Arts. And the Earth Initiative, and so on. But go down to that one that's uh, third from the bottom, Sustainable Resources Group International. They got $1.6 trillion, not billion, not million, trillion dollars from the Defense Department because it actually consists of about 50 different groups that do all kinds of things for the military that we don't even know what they are. Uh, we've got Earth Savers that got 70, and I don't know who they are, and Sustainability A to Z LLC, I don't know who they are. They are. I would have to spend a great deal of time looking through all of the details which are there on that website. If you want to see what any one of these is like and what it was for, what they did with it, who was involved, it's all there. Just go look. Okay, uh, let's have the next slide, please. Damien, let's go to the next slide. We don't need this. This is just a place marker. Let's go see who they are. Next slide. <clears throat> Here you have uh, the lust for grants really shows. Uh, International Council for Science. Uh, all they want is the money for grants so that they can keep being scientists. The American Cancer Society, well, really, uh, that's not as bad as the American Lung Association, which is one of the worst shills for the EPA. And if they say, oh, there's a air problem and we want to have a new regulation, okay, just go to the American Lung Society. They'll hire doctors that will do a study, and it will come up and find out, oh, there's terrible asthma cases all over wherever there's any kind of CO2 or particulate matter or whatever. Just, it's just absolutely criminal, but nobody's doing anything about it. National Science Foundation, uh, many people have heard of it, but they get their money largely from the government and uh, it's all scientists. And the next one, though, is uh, particularly important. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. Uh, we, let's go back that on, on that one, if you will, CJ. Can you go back on that one? Nope, backwards, the other direction. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Right in the middle, International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. Uh, that's very important because they wrote part of Agenda 21, uh, where Morris Strong and his uh, uh, crew in Geneva were actually writing this uh, in the summer just before the carnival in Rio, the uh, first, the 1992 uh, Earth Summit. Uh, IUCN uh, has seven different secretariats in it. They're a huge organization, and uh, two of them uh, gave probably 30, 40 different uh, of the uh, uh, very important ideas into Agenda 21. So they're 
uh, one of these academic uh, outfits that's very, very important. Uh, the rest of them, we can go on uh, to the next slide, please. All right, intergovernmental agencies. Let's go to the next slide and we'll see what they are. That's global political power. You can think of intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC. Uh, they write all these reports so that government can make rules that says, oh, the world is going to come to an end. Let's, uh, uh, let's do something about it at your expense. Let's divert all of our resources to something we don't really need to do. Now, nobody ever even heard of the Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on Sustainable Development Financing, but believe me, it sits there in the UN not doing a lot of good. Now, let's, uh, what does it mean, intergovernmental? That's very important. They are owned by nations. They're only housed in the United Nations. They are not the property of the United, Sta United Nations. Now, the United States uses these intergovernmentals like the IPCC to assert global and domestic power of their own. And we in the United States, because we're the biggest donor, has funding, censorship, and veto power over them. Now, that sounds like a quandary, and you have to go into a little bit of detail we're not going to go into, but that's, that actually is what happens. The United States government has a profound uh, influence and censorship of the science and of the summaries on the climate change in particular. So uh, let's go on to the next one. Okay, international agencies. International is different than intergovernmental. Let's go to the next slide and see what that is. That actually is uh, outfits that have considerable amount to do with governments. Uh, of, uh, but they're not really the property of governments like the intergovernmental groups are. Like the Global Environment Facility is a piece of the World Bank. Well, that's kind of a little bit of everybody. Uh, now, the next one, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, based in Paris, has been very important. Uh, they, the guy who developed DDT way back in the days in World War II to help our troops uh, not get malaria, uh, while we were fighting in Italy and Sicily, uh, they came, it came from there. But also, Alexander King did, who was one of the six founders of the Club of Rome, which became important for Agenda 21 for the fact that uh, after six, these six totally unknown Europeans got together, formed this, they were able to get some people at MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to, to publish this important book called the limits to growth. And if you want something that has been a disaster, that introduced to the world these ideas that you could have computer models that could predict the future accurately, which is nonsense. It can't. I mean, their crystal ball is no better than yours. It also introduced the idea of man-made climate change. That's where that idea was first published. It existed before, but it had never been published. And it also came up with the principle that because the problem was global, only powerful global governments can deal with the problem. And uh, that's Agenda 21 all over. But uh, that just sort of came about there. Actually, a ver the Club of Rome is very weak now. It never really was very powerful. It was influential. And that's a difference. See, you don't even have to have the boots on the ground to win the war. If you have these ideas, other people will get the idea, and they'll put their boots on the ground. That's what happened to the Club of Rome. It's almost meaningless except for that one thing, the limits to growth. Okay, let's go to the next one so that we can... These are transnational organizations. This one is something you probably have not heard of. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is about non-state global action. All of these on here, I just picked them at random to show you what a hodgepodge of non-state global action groups there are all that means is that they don't belong to any government, they don't answer to any government, uh, and they're not any government. They just go where they want to, and borders don't mean anything to them. They go around the world. So you've got Greenpeace, Air France, Catholic Church. I just picked that out of a hat. It could be any religion. Uh, any church could do this. Chase Manhattan, Friends of the Earth, Baltic, blah, 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 blah. All down there. Just think of any outfit that can go across borders with no problem. There are thousands of these all over the world. What you're looking at is actually something that could be 
a piece of structure that's happening to society and the world that will help Agenda 21 go away. And that is, it is a global society without a state. Think about that. Uh, that could go somewhere. That idea is perhaps part of a future we can't even see yet, but uh, I'm not going to make any prophecies, but that's pretty much what I've got to tell you. And if you aren't data overloaded by now, you've got some kind of brain better than mine. Thank you very much for listening, even if you couldn't hear. Thank you, Ron. Uh, you know, $1.6 trillion. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and you can see by everything that Ron's been showing you that uh, this is in every corner of our society, everywhere you turn, uh, no matter what you're dealing with, it's why all the news media is filled with it. It's why every corporation, every uh, organization that you get into. You know, sometimes we'll say, uh, well, you know, the, the YMCA is involved in putting these things together. So, oh, come on. You begin to see this matrix of, of uh, money that goes into organizations that have been traditional in our country for uh, many, many years, and, and suddenly they're changing their positions, they're changing the propaganda that comes out of them because of this kind of funding. And that's why, you know, I, that's why I wanted to make sure that we spent more than one session on these NGOs and on uh, what's funding them. And, and, and what I'm saying NGOs is I'm not, I'm not just talking about the non-governmental organizations that are sanctioned by the UN, but this whole matrix of organizations is, and, and foundations and uh, all these entities that Ron's been pointing out. So uh, I hope that helps you understand a little bit of the massive force that we are up against what we need to uh, fight against. But, but don't you find it interesting when you when you have all of this information that they're afraid of us because we are beginning to expose all this. And that can take a huge chunk out of them and, uh, and legitimize them if we can show who these people are and uh, in this kind of funding. Now, Ron has, uh, Ron, your website, uh, Undo Influence, I know you told me that you need to update it and so forth, but you've still got a mass of information on that uh, on that website that people can go into and uh, see all these this web of connections with the amount of money. Uh, Sunduinfluence.com. Yeah. yeah, that's what it is. Sunduinfluence.com. There's about a little bit over 200 profiles, but uh, as I said, they're not up to date. Uh, we've got different plans for bringing that up to date in a different form. But yeah, it's there now and you can just uh, you can just keep on looking. Well, I'm really pleased to uh, have Craig Rucker with us from uh, CFAC, the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. We worked with Craig and uh, his people for years and uh, they have done incredible work. And one of the things I'm really excited about is that Craig goes to these international meetings and uh, is rubbing shoulders with these NGOs, is, is there, he's in the belly of the beast. And uh, I'm, I'm excited that uh, Craig's gonna tell us uh, what he sees there and what, what the atmosphere is and what these people really say. Uh, and uh, I, I think it helps all of us to understand a little bit more about what we're up against. And uh, also, uh, Craig and his group do some fantastic guerrilla theater that uh, I want him to share with us. And we've got some videos that uh, he has uh, recorded at these meetings that will give you quite a, uh, an insight of what's going on there. So, uh, Craig, are you guys, uh, is CFAC uh, an NGO itself? Uh, yes, Tom, as a matter of fact, we are. Let me, uh, let me just start by thanking you, Tom, for having me on the program. Uh, what are your agenda here, whatever this is, a webinar, I guess. Uh, we have tried very hard to you to come with us to a number of these uh, different events, and uh, I, I only regret is, is as long as we've been working together against the forces of darkness, you have not joined me yet on these international conferences, but we're going to get you there these days. Uh, yeah, CFACT is a recognized NGO at the uh, United Nations. Uh, we're one of the few that are free market, uh, conservative oriented that work on these sorts of issues. I have to find this conflict. Let's do it. Well, and I, I don't think the UN knew quite what they were doing when they recognized us. I think they, the assumption was when we first were recognized back in the early 1990s that uh, we were probably part of the uh, liberal cabal that generally is affiliated with the UN. 
Uh, but we snuck in, and part of the reason we did that is during our research, uh, we've been around since 1985, uh, following environmental type uh, related issues and UN activities, and we noted that a lot of the uh, uh, issues that were coming forth in the United States and, and elsewhere, we, as, as did Utah, uh, found their genesis really at the United Nations, and we thought it was important that there be some sort of free market presence there to at least monitor. And as things have developed, we've uh, done a little more than monitoring. We've actually uh, participated in uh, both press conferences and a little bit of guerrilla warfare in order to stir things up a bit. Now, yeah, one that's, of the things that's that we think is mean, important yeah. in this uh, whole debate is trying to educate the American people. So. When we went to our first one, which was back in 1992 during the Rio Earth Summit, uh, I myself didn't go to that one. But we sent uh, Dixie Lee Ray, the former governor of the state of Washington. She wasn't the governor at that time. Uh, but we sent her to the UN Earth Summit down in Rio de Janeiro, which uh, took place back then. I myself was actually invited to go and in, uh, before this conference to talk to President George H. Bush, along with Morton Blackwell and a number of other people. And we were going to warn uh, George Bush not to uh, go to this particular conference because we knew there were a number of documents coming out of there. You had a convention on forestry, biodiversity, um, climate change, and of course, Agenda 21. Uh, all these documents were on the table back then. Uh, we were going to, I was scheduled to meet, got my security clearance and everything, was going to go in and talk with uh, uh, Bush or at least one of Bush's people, we were told the president. And at the last minute, he canceled it. And his reason for doing so was, uh, he said, I need to go there because election's coming up. I've got to be seen as an environmental uh, president. This will help me in my election against uh, Bill Clinton. And uh, we see how well that worked for him. Uh, nevertheless, he went down there. And uh, he also tried to placate the uh, free market forces and the conservatives by saying, I will sign documents, but they won't be binding. And in fact, uh, that's the way it, it started initially. He signed a convention on climate change that wasn't binding. It angered the Greens uh, and a number of other things. Agenda 21, for example, is something that's considered soft law and we're not bound by its dictates. Uh, of course, we were going to warn, as, uh, as you were as well back then, uh, Tom, that we knew this was all a, a charade, that in fact the Greens would try to make them binding or they would at least try to get their tenants at the local level and make them binding on the local level. Uh, so anyway, we started going to these conferences. My first one was in uh, 1994 in Istanbul, and I've been to probably, oh boy, maybe 15 or 20 after that, all around the world. Uh, we started principally as kind of a small operation that was looking uh, at trying to just get information back to the American people. So we spent a lot of time on the radio. And sometimes back in the early 90s, before the internet and everything, it was very difficult to get uh, telephone service back to the United States onto a radio program with any clarity. Uh, but we did it and started expanding our operations. We said, why don't we bring over some experts and scientists and hold press conferences and, um, you know, poke fun at the other side. And uh, these built and built and we had a uh, extremely big one in uh, Kyoto, uh, Japan back in 97. and. Uh, we're able to just attract a lot of media to it. And so pretty much every year we uh, since then, and including this year and years beyond, we are going to bring down people that we think would be of interest to the media. Uh, it could be scientists like Dr. Roy Spencer from Alabama, uh, Lord Christopher Moncton, uh, who's a, a noted climate skeptic. Uh, we bring in, uh, right now we're bringing in an Apollo astronaut, uh, which we brought to Poland last year, and we'll be bringing one in again this year. Uh, again, sometimes our press conferences aren't covered entirely because the media has its own agenda. So we've up the ante again and we started doing some street theater. Uh, our first one occurred back in 1997 in uh, Kyoto, and that one was kind of fun. Uh, essentially what happened was I was in the media center, and the Greens, for their part, always did uh, the type of uh, street theater and that, that garnered media attention. And they were doing it that day that I happened to be in the media center in Kyoto. They were taking this ball, and it was a, a globe, and it was hollowed out at the top with a hole in the middle, and it was burning incense. And they were wandering through the media center, being followed by an absolute ton of media. And as they were wandering through, um, 
they were giving their little spiel about how they were going to give this award, is what they called it, to the Global Climate Coalition, which was a business NGO. It was called the uh, Scorched Earth Award. And it looked, you know, just like a, a bunch of groupies following them. The media loved it. Uh, they walked up to the Global Climate Coalition office and handed it. I myself was in that crowd. And when the Global Climate Coalition it took the uh, took the award, a spokesman for them, he took it, he threw it, of all people, to me. And, of course, then the media all focused on me and said, hey, they thought I was part of the Global Climate Coalition, which I wasn't. And they said, what are you going to do with this? And the idea came to my head. I said, why don't we recycle this award? Except, you know, if you recycle, because that's the environmental thing, of course, it may come back in a different form than you originally got it. And so we did. We said, be back here at 2 o'clock, and we will recycle this award and give it back to the owners, which was Friends of the Earth. No o'clock rolls around. We work with uh, uh, <clears throat> the good folks at CEI and others who were also at that conference, and uh, we made it into the Scorched Economy Award. Put a big banner right in the middle of the media center, and it looked like a Beatles concert. There was just so much media there, and we were able... Uh, right in front of the media to challenge Friends of the Earth and the World Wildlife Fund to a debate on climate change. And consequently, uh, that was the only time in the whole Kyoto process, which led to the Kyoto Treaty, that the science was even debated. And so we saw the effectiveness on that particular time of being able to do street theater. And of course, we've upped it since then. Uh, we've done more and more daring things. In some cases, we've uh, done large street protests, bringing students into Bonn, Germany, uh, one of them dressed as a cow that's holding a sign that said, uh, Are my gases creating climate catastrophe? That's crap. We made page two of USA Today. Uh, we were able to board Greenpeace ships in Copenhagen, uh, which is a whole story in and of itself, and drop a banner off them. Uh, we were able to parachute out of Durban into the conference, made the front page section of the uh, uh, Durban newspapers in South Africa. Uh, so we've done these types of stunts over and over, and uh, they become part of the CFAC program whenever we go to these international summits, and we expect to continue doing them. One of the things that I know is of interest here, uh, people that are attending this uh, seminar here, is the issue of Bickley and Agenda 21. Uh, we noted back as long as 1992, during that first Earth Summit that I spoke, uh, spoke about previously, that there was going to be an initiative to try and influence local communities with the sustainable development uh, agenda. Uh, the document that really received almost low attention back then was the uh, one dealing with the <coughs> Agenda 21. And the reason it didn't is it didn't have any binding mandates. It was soft law. Uh, I initially thought it was uh, something that was dangerous, but will confess, I wasn't sure that was the one we needed to worry about as much as, say, the Biodiversity Treaty or the uh, Treaty on Climate Change. But what they had going along with it were a number of organizations, one of which is the uh, ICLE organization, uh, the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, which formed actually before that uh, treaty uh, for the sole purpose of pushing Agenda 21 and the uh, uh, whole sustainable development program under the governmental level right directly to the local communities. Uh, for a number of years, we monitored this, and this organization grew. Uh, there were a number of other uh, entities, some governmental, like the President's Commission on Sustainable Development in the 1990s, that assisted this organization. Communities started to join it, paying actual dues memberships uh, to be part of this collection. Um, and our attention initially was focused a lot on the Biodiversity Treaty and working with Michael Kaufman and a uh, couple of U.S. Senators, we were able to defeat it. Uh, then we took aim at the uh, Climate Change Treaty, and we were able to stop it uh, from being uh, ratified, which was the Kyoto Treaty, and we continued working on that one pretty aggressively. But the Italy one just kind of moved along. And uh, while we uh, engaged in trying to fight some of these initiatives on a local battle, one of the things that was missing was actually having a presence in getting inside the Italy operation. And so we sought to do just that. Uh, back in 2009, well, excuse me, 2009, we heard that there was going to be a meeting coming up in Belo Horizonte, Brazil in 2012. Uh, this was to go alongside the 20th anniversary of that uh, Earth Summit that took place back in 1992. So 92 to 2012, there's the 20th anniversary, and uh, the whole issue of sustainable development was going to be at the port again. 
And so we wanted to make sure that CFAC, maybe just like we're going to the UN summits, could go to the ICLEI summit as well. And so we went there. Uh, what happened was I happened to be down at the, uh, the bigger conference, which was at Rio anyway, and uh, most of our CFAC delegation stayed kind of working things at that uh, main conference, but two of us, myself and one of our collegiate students, one of the things CFAC has is we have CFAC college chapters all over the country, and sometimes we take students to these meetings as worker bees. Uh, we took off on a plane and went to Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And uh, when we landed in there, again, Italy had no idea that there would be a free market organization attending one of their, uh, their meetings because nobody ever has in the past. And uh, because of the fact that we were able to come in there and somewhat sucker punch them, I was able to make some friendships. And one of them was with a guy named Hans Manninghoff, who was a co-founder of Italy. He's a gentleman uh, from Germany uh, who is the uh, director of economic and environmental affairs for the city of Hanford. And uh, a very likable gentleman, uh, good English, and we were able to actually strike up a, a little bit of a uh, amusing relationship during that particular time where we talked very candidly. Again, he had no idea who I was, uh, but we got to be such friends that when I would come in for the dinner during the uh, two or three days that I was at the Ickley meeting, he would raise his hand and have me sit down beside him. I interviewed him on uh, extensively on uh, video and got the inside story about how he was founded and some of the things that they're very interested in, which is a lot to do with money, trying to get it from the local organizations, and uh, some of their techniques as well. Uh, I also met uh, the following year, I went to another ICLEI meeting in Bonn, Germany, and I met the direct executive director of USA ICLEI named Michael Schmitz, who's headquartered out in San Francisco. And uh, he told me a lot of things too, uh, about not just how they were founded, but also in terms of what their objectives are. Uh, a couple broad things, because I know our time is limited here, but I want to just give you some uh, general observations. One, number one is is that this Ickley meeting is largely a bureaucratic get-together. Uh, uh, people that were attending this were overwhelmingly people that were in local governments around the world, and they have budgets, a lot of them are travel budgets, and they want to go and uh, see the world, and Ickley is one of the excuses they can have uh, to go do this. Are they ideological? Absolutely. Uh, but I would say a good many of them are just enjoying the ride to go down to Belo Horizonte, Brazil, and the like. And, uh, you know, so I think that we can look at this as a, a, many of them are people that are simply bureaucrats that are traveling to go to these particular programs that are learning how to put sustainable development into their, uh, the agendas of their local governments. Uh, secondly, uh, I think that they are trying to accomplish specific things. Uh, these would include uh, trying to make our cities into agricultural centers, uh, certainly pushing public transport. I spoke with one gentleman from Copenhagen who's, you know, using the ICLEI uh, model and using ICLEI's resources to try to get 25% of the people of Copenhagen to ride bicycles by 2020. Uh, they're very into green buildings, trying to make sure that the code of their various cities uh, line up with what uh, is considered sustainable according to both Agenda 21 and the dialogue that's going on at the early meeting. So they have some specific objectives, but they're very broad in how they allow the bureaucrats to implement them. So it's difficult to pinpoint exactly if it's a, you know, a direct line from Agenda 21 or it's uh, principles that are being taught to them and they're just in, in implementing them on the local level. Uh, their workshops that they have for these people, fairly touchy-feely. And in fact, uh, this might be a good time uh, to show uh, a, one of the videos, because when you ask them, for example, what is sustainable development and, you know, what do you think it is? Uh, that's how some of these workshops are. They actually ask the people, can you tell us how you think you can uh, bring people together in your community of various genders and uh, ethnicities and, and make the, your community sustainable? Uh, how do you think you can in, uh, incorporate a UN program into your community? You get, you get very kind of convoluted answers a lot of time, because a lot of it's almost reminds me of a college workshop back in the 60s where people sit around in a circle just kind of talking about what they think and how they're going to implement it. I think that one of the other observations I had in Italy was that the average delegate there tends to be a little bit arrogant. That is, they believe very strongly in their uh, fundamental mission, which is to impose 
sustainable development. Uh, and they look very much down their business and anybody who opposes them as being just outside the norm. That said, they're also very afraid of people in the Tea Party or anybody who opposes them. How do I know this? Because they disguise their agenda. One of the things that I talked very candidly to some Australians about was how do you sell your program to your local community? They said, well, because we have opposition in Australia, which is something we may take note of. I didn't know there was opposition in Australia until I went there. But they said that they have to not use the term uh, climate change, for example, because it's so diversive. In fact, we just have now a new administration in Australia that campaigned against the carbon tax. So there is opposition to some of the stuff that they were doing trying to make carbon-free cities. Uh, they have to use things like sustainable development or uh, uh, smart growth or things of that sort, sort of uh, words that would ameliorate any sort of possible hostility out there. Uh, when I spoke with Michael Schmidt, the uh, executive director of the United States, uh, Italy, he himself told me that it's very frustrating because they're losing chapters, uh, which means money. And uh, again, he did not know where I was coming from, at least the first day when I met him in Bonn. And uh, just told me that it's, uh, it's a real shame. And he had some real harsh words, of course, for uh, people like you, Tom, and uh, others that are out there trying to fight this, uh, about a thorn you've been in their side. Uh, so anyway, uh, they are afraid. They know that we've been effective. And uh, they want to make sure that they disguise their agenda using euphemisms, uh, code words, and buzzwords that can sell with the public. Uh, Glenn Beck is one of the uh, particular ones they fear. Uh, in fact, when I was down in uh, Belo Horizonte the first time, uh, the main speaker, uh, it wasn't including Hans Mondinghoff, but it was one of his cohorts, uh, took a whole section of his speech just uh, lasting. Uh, Glenn Beck in particular for his bringing out of Agenda 21, which I thought was unusual to have a bunch of you know, bureaucrats gathered from around the world and take such a good percentage of your time blasting Glenn Beck. Uh, but he did. Uh, fortunately, we were able to video that. Uh, we sent it to the Blaze, and they uh, televised it, so we were able to make some good use of that. Um, so, in any event, I would say they are afraid of us. They're arrogant, thinking that they have the right way, and they're going to be condescending, but there is a healthy fear of what we're doing, and they are being deceptive. And the last thing I want to mention is there's a lot of hypocrisy. Though they talk like they care for the poor and they care about the environment, in essence, when you are uh, down there, it's anything but a um, uh, it's anything but a conference that's uh, some, somewhat trying to showcase, you know, that the people are struggling in the war. These people live it up, and they go down there.